I see you have the hat, the world's best chess coach. Uh, <laughs> the guys at our chess club uh, created a hat called chess, Checks, Captures, and Threats that they sell on on uh, uh, Cafe Press. Yeah. Yeah, the hat, obviously, um, you, you'd be a stronger chess coach than myself with your uh, your vast uh, experience with it. And also um, having worked with uh, Howard Stern, right? That's one of, your, one of the students you worked with a while back. Yes, Howard was a great student. And I say that in the sense that he always knew I was on his side. You know, we, we, we spent a lot of hours on the Skype and phone together, you know, talking like we're doing here. And, uh, you know, when you spend that many hours with someone, occasionally you say things wrong. And sometimes you have students who are very sensitive. And if you say something wrong, they take offense. And this Howard never took offense. He always knew I was on his side. He always knew I was trying to help him. And if something came out the wrong way, he just immediately gave me the benefit of the doubt. And that made it so easy to work with him. Um, you know, I, I always feel bad if I'm, if I'm teaching a student and they start to get defensive or they think I'm trying to be, you know, somehow critical in, of them in a non-constructive way. Yeah. I just feel really bad when that happens. But part of your job, you know, when you're trying to make someone better, you know, you, you want to encourage them and you want to say what they're doing right. But let's face it, most of the things that you're helping people with when you're coaching them is finding things where they're either doing a misconception and they really, you know, they're using a principle wrong or they miss some sort of pattern that they should know or they shouldn't know in that case. Or they, you know, they, they do something wrong they don't know and you say, oh, this is wrong, you should do this. And, you know, unfortunately that's constructive criticism, but some people, you know, kind of think you're trying to be like upset with them. And one of the things that is my strength and weakness is I never teach in a monotone. <laughs> you know, I'm not one of these kind of matter of fact people. I'm always more like, oh, and, you know, some people, if you say like, oh, what'd you do that for? They're like, oh, this guy's like, gets mad at me. And I'm like, no, I'm not mad at you. I just, you know, I, I teach with a lot of emotion. So uh, that's nothing personal. And right. I don't try to, I'm not trying to intimidate or scare my students, but sometimes, unfortunately, it, for, for people that are more sensitive, that has that effect. And then I have other people that go like, oh, yeah, that's why I hired you, because I, yeah. I want someone who's enthusiastic. I would, I would definitely want to know my def deficiencies if I was working with you, because it, it's hard to improve at chess if you're not aware of what maybe you're not uh, performing well at currently. You know, if it's uh, analysis or calculation, um, you had some interesting things in your um, in another interview I listened to recently, where you talked about the idea of taking extra time to analyze and maybe uh, Jakob Argard's uh, calculation book being helpful for for that as well. Um, well, that book's a very advanced book. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it for anyone rated under 1900. Uh, the positions in that book are quite difficult, and of course, if you're rated 1400 and you're making moves where your pieces aren't even safe picking up a position where a 2000 player would have to work 20 minutes to try to figure out what's going on is probably, you know, it's sort of like you're in fifth grade and you're working on your long division and all of a sudden someone gives you a really good calculus book. Right. So, so I, I, you see this a lot in chess, you know, you don't see it in math very often because people go to school and nobody gives third graders calculus books because, you know, they know they won't understand them. The, the problem in chess is it's not like calculus. If you pick up a calculus book when you're in third grade, you're going to know right away that you, it's not going to help you. But once you get to be a half-decent chess player, and I don't mean like 2,000, I mean like even 1,200, you could pick up some of the most advanced chess books ever written, and you're going to understand pretty much everything in there. The problem is you're reading the wrong things. It's not what's going to help you. I saw an 8-year-old the other day. Um, he was carrying a copy of My 60 Memorable Games. <laughs> Which, of course, is a great, great book, but I wouldn't even give it to an eight-year-old if he was one of the top eight-year-olds in the country. Well, maybe, but, you know, for most eight-year-olds, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? You yeah. know? But, but when, you go to a chess, when you go to a bookstore, you know, there's all these chess books, and, you know, they don't say this is a third-grade book, this is an eighth-grade book. Um, and, of course, they want to sell books, so people who write books are going to try to tell it, this is a good book for everybody, and, you know, I, my book uh, can really help everybody. And the answer is, well, maybe to a small extent, but if you're trying to really get better, you really want to work on the things that are, like, next for you. And you want to not get better without filling in the gaps, because if you get up to, like, 16, 1700, and you have gaps in your knowledge and in what you understand then when you read the next level books, which of course is what you want to do, but you skipped stuff earlier, you, you have trouble getting better because you haven't filled in the gaps, so to speak, on what you really need to know. 
So you see all these kind of problems that you don't see in, in school subjects because people get them in order and they're, they're, they can't get out of order. And in chess, I, I see this all the time. People come to me and they say, I'm 1,200. I want to be 1,500. Let me show you the books I've been reading. And they, they give me a list of six or seven books. And it'll be everything from, as I said, from calculus books down to fun with Dick and Jane. Yeah. And they don't realize that they're reading books that are all different levels. And then I kind of say to them, well, why don't we just concentrate on these two or three books that are appropriate for what, what you really should be learning? Nice. Yeah, that's one of the benefits of having a coach then is to help isolate that material and get them in contact with a material that at their level is going to help them grow the quickest, right? Because um, if it's obviously it's way beyond, beyond them, it's going to be hard for them to keep up with the material. And if it's beneath them, they're, they're potentially not growing but feeling good about solving uh, positions, right? Like they, right. right. Uh, you know, I, what I tell people, and I, I, don't, I don't remember if I said this in the last uh, interview, but there's a triangle of learning, which is in, whether you're in school or whether you're taking lessons from a coach or whatever. And the triangle is study, play, and get feedback. And if we, if we apply it to school, everybody sort of understands what study and play is in school. The study is when, you know, when you're studying the, the play for, for school would be when the, when the teacher's actually giving you information. And then the feedback is the part where, you know, you get your, you take tests and you get the test back and they tell you what you did and you take quizzes. You go over your homework. The teacher brings you up to the board and has you go over your homework. You're allowed to ask teacher questions. The teacher will give you a lecture and say, here's what we're going to do about uh, chemistry today. But then when you have a question, you raise your hand and you say, well, what about this? But you see in chess, a lot of people don't understand that. And they think that if they just play and study and play and study and play and study, that they'll get better. And the only kind of feedback they get is occasionally they look up their openings in a book or they'll give their game to an engine, which really can't explain anything to them except, you know, here's the line you missed. Right. And they, they really they miss that feedback dimension. And then they wonder why they don't get better. Well, if you went to school and you could never ask the teacher a question and they never gave you back your tests and they never graded your homeworks and you never got to discuss anything with anyone, you just read your books and listened to lectures, school would be much less effective. But yet in chess, people think that they can get away without the feedback. And that's unfortunate, but um, it just takes all three. I, I was very fortunate that when I started, I joined one of the best chess clubs in Philadelphia, the Germantown Chess Club. And I picked the brains of a lot of the best players in Philadelphia, Richard Lunenfeld, Richard Pariso, Don Lotzel, uh, Jerry Kolker, uh, you know, people like that. And they were, they were nice people, and they were willing to help me and go over their games with me and my games. And, you know, I got to pick their brains all the time. We didn't have good engines to go over games, but uh, at least I had people I could ask questions of. And that was great. And then when I went to college, Donald Byrne was the chess coach. And of course, he was one of the top 10 players in the country. And he was he was also a very nice guy and willing to go over games and answer questions. So that was all great. Oh, wow. Um, with that chess club, the Germantown Chess Club, does that still exist today? Is that still um, a uh, club No, or? I don't think so. I think it hasn't existed for like okay. maybe almost 40 years now. And I know with the, with the COVID-19, obviously chess clubs have been uh, stymied a bit unless they're doing yeah. it on Zoom. But um, if people are in the Philly area, do you have a chess club you'd recommend now or um, a gathering where people are... Uh, on my website, I have a, a page of chess clubs in the Philadelphia area. Okay. Um, the only problem is that, you know, I'm not as active in the in the community as I was when I was an active player. And when people create new clubs, they don't tell me and they don't update. So I have a lot of the clubs that have been around for 30, 40 years. The Mainline Chess Club, Chaturanga Chess Club, Tri-State Chess Club, the famous Franklin Mercantile down, downtown, the Masterminds Chess Club. You know, all, all these clubs are listed on my website, uh, but if somebody changes who the contact person is or if that club uh, closes or a new one opens, unless someone thinks to tell me, and occasionally yeah. they do, that then people say to me, oh, I called that number that was on your website and, you know, the, the Chinese deli answered and uh, I, I don't know how to get a hold of that club. And I'm like, oh, I guess they changed their contact information, but uh, I, I don't know who the new contact is. So one thing that kind of grabbed me about you and interested me a lot uh, in you as a subject for uh, doing an interview was the fact that when you write books, you mentioned that you always look for new content. You don't want to just give uh, the same things that are out there. You're looking for uh, new thoughts, new terms, new ideas in chess, and, um, and especially related to like amateur play and improving um, on amateur play and getting stronger, right? 
So, yes, of all my 12 books, I would say one of them was the idea of my publisher, uh, Hannon Russell, who's the publisher for your um, Russell Enterprises. He came up with an idea of having a series called Back to Basics. And he asked me to write the book Back to Basics Tactics. And I said to him, well, I always want to write books that nobody else has ever written about. I want to talk about things that, that you can't find elsewhere. And I said, but, but everybody writes basic tactics books. And he says, but I think you can do a good job and I'd like you to do it. So I said, okay. And then I found that it gave me the opportunity to write that first chapter, which is on counting, which is probably, in terms of my legacy, it's probably one of the top three or four things I've ever done in chess is come up with this idea of naming certain types of tactics that never had a name before. And I, I don't know if I said this in the other interview as well, but the one that you listened to, but um, when I came up with the idea for it and I wrote about it in my Novice Nook column, um, I said, well, I'd like to call this idea this tactic counting. And I found Dr. John Nunn, the famous grandmaster and PhD mathematician on the web, and he's written a lot of chess books and he names things also. So I sent to him and I said, Dr. Nunn, you wrote a book called uh, Learning Chess Tactics, and you have a chapter called Miscellaneous. And in the following problems in that chapter, and I gave some numbers of, of the problems, I'm writing a chapter on th these kind of problems. And I'm, I'd like to call it counting because what we're doing is we're, we're evaluating whether any series of trades on any squares will win material. And I said, I'd like to call that tactic a name. And I said, I'm, I've decided to, in my article, I'm going to call it counting. What do you think? And Dr. Nunn was nice enough to write back to me and say, uh, yes, that's as good a name as any. So I felt good that he had given me his blessing. And I wrote the article. And the first chapter in my Back to Basics book is called uh, Introduction to Safety and Counting. And a lot of people misunderstand. They think counting is knowing that bishops are worth three and knights are worth three and rooks are worth five, the basic value of the pieces, which, of course, Larry Kaufman's the world's leading expert on that. And that's not what it is really. It's really trying to see if any series of trades on any squares, and this involves multiple squares, can get very, very complicated, wins material. And I, I, I did a couple of videos on it, and one, one guy came up on the video and he criticized me very heavily and he said, you're just trying to be, you know, get, get well known by making things up. And he said, he said, this idea of counting isn't new. He said, it's just analysis. Yeah. Well, counting is part of analysis, just like every tactic is part of analysis. You know, looking at pins is part of analysis. Figuring out whether your double attack works is part of analysis. So he was kind of comparing apples and oranges. And what I was trying to say to him is, counting is only a tactic when it wins material. If it doesn't win material, it's not a tactic. But that's true with every tactic. If you double attack two pieces and your opponent can save them, then your, your attempt at a tactic fails. If you pin a piece, very often all you're doing is making sure it can't easily move. You're not necessarily winning material. So pinning isn't always a tactic. But when pinning does win material, it becomes a tactic. Well, counting's no different than double attacks or pins or anything else. You analyze it, and if it turns out, I can say, oh, I can take on b6, and when, if he takes on e3, I can take on a8, and then when he takes on f2, I can take back on f2, and when he takes on a8, I win the exchange. Well, that's a counting tactic. It's not any other tactic. Um, yeah. And in that case, if it wins material, it becomes a tactic. If you say those, those same things I just said, and it ends up, oh, and now it's even, the answer is, well, you're analyzing, but it's not a tactic and in this particular case because those sequence of trades ends up being even, so it's not a tactic. Exactly. I know that's a long answer to your question, but... No, uh, that's, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm, and, and I'm that's very wonderful... proud of that idea, anyway, of, of naming that idea. Yeah, I really like what you brought up there, too. I think so many people get focused on a discovered attack or these things in chess that exist that by themselves are not a tactic, and so a student or someone will play this move and be like, but I got a discovered attack. And I'm like, yes, you had a discovered attack, but what you did with it is you went back to a quality. So you... You had this wonderful idea on the board, and but you didn't use it in a way that um, that won you material, right? So that tying in with your idea there about you know it's good it's good to identify the counting and such, but to make it really be a tactical piece, then it's got to involve the gain of material uh, or or a positional advantage, something that's going to well help gain you material. Win. I use gain of material or checkmate. Okay. Uh, of course, you can't have a. There's no counting tactic that's checkmates because. 
you, you, you can't trade off the king. So <laughs> just like, you know, you know, the, the, there's lots of other tactics that, you know, generally d might not involve kings, but that's OK. And you also uh, have a, a, right now on YouTube, you have 10 difficult counting tactics as one of the videos that's out there. And I really enjoyed watching this video today. I was watching part of it um, earlier this morning, and um, it was really nice to see the way your cadence in that is fantastic. You had some really challenging positions, and then rather than just uh, you know kind of sprinting your way through it, you were kind of asking and talking about the position and saying, you know, and, and here I chose this move, and I and you, but, you, but you slowed it down to the point that you could really think about and analyze those positions right along with you as you went over the game, and um, and also you gave us a chance to consider why. You know, why, why would this move with the Rook be the best move here in this end game? And I think those are good questions and good things to be looking at. You know, so many people uh, just kind of like playing through the moves, but not really giving you that chance or the understanding. But you, um, you definitely helped me um, gain more insight, I guess, in like a Rook and Pawn end game uh, with a Knight around. And then, and then also how that Knight can maybe even work really well against the Rook. Um, you showed some tricks, too, with like the Knight coming into C2, helping a Pawn Queen. So um, if people, just for the people that are watching, I'm just saying, That'd be a really good thing to check out would be um, your video, your 10 difficult counting tactics video related to this counting tactics discussion. So um, the other right, If I remember, I think it probably had a slightly different name. I, I double check, but I thought that was. Yeah, because I don't I don't think I have a video called the 10 different. But I think you're talking about I, work, I did two videos on counting and I think you're talking about the first one of the two. I think so. But let me Heisman. Because the second one, I think, is called something like back to basics counting. And I forget the name of the first one, but I, I, I can look it up right now if you'd like. Yeah, oh, it said Amateur Game 10, Difficult Counting Tactics is what I saw. Oh, Amateur Game Number 10. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually not the video on counting. It just happens to be a, a, a amateur game where counting was a big issue in that game. Yeah, and I, was really, I really enjoyed going through that. And, and then um, just seeing you as an instructor, too, in the video. I, I hadn't watched ICC videos with you in quite a while. I remember seeing those uh, a while back I was watching your videos, but it was nice to get reminded of you as a teacher and the... Uh, the wonderful job that you do with sharing and teaching chess. Um, Dan, of course, now a full-time chess instructor. So if anybody is looking for coaching and such, you know, Dan's going to be a wonderful person to reach out to. Extremely accomplished in the uh, the chess arena, and um, and he will be able to help you guys find those deficiencies and improve them in your game. So um, you'll want to reach out and look for him on his website, which was just posted in the channel there. Um, if you want to reach out and talk to him and uh, work on getting coaching, but he's absolutely fantastic. Um, right, I have this curious name for my channel, for, for my uh, website called danheisman.com. <laughs> nice, yeah, right? And then... so, in fact, sometimes people say to me, I couldn't find you on the web. And I'm like, if you Google, uh, Dan Heisman's not the most common name. So if you yeah. Google Dan Heisman, I'm like the entire first page of Google. No, if, if they mispronounced <laughs> including my it. website. So it's like, you couldn't find me? Maybe with a mispronunciation. Maybe they put a Z in there. They might have had the, the Heisman instead of Heisman. Right, right. Yeah, we've talked about yeah, that. Yeah, the, but, yeah my great-grandfather's first cousin, John Heisman, and left the endowment for the Heisman Trophy. And they always mispronounce it Heisman for the reasons we talked about. Uh, but we've tried to correct them. Uh, you know, we've gone to the Heisman Trophy dinner and said that's not how the family pronounces the name and they're like that's nice we actually have a question for you it's uh he's great one of these guys is curious um what's your rating and how did you become a national master what were the steps you took to accomplish that uh wonderful achievement okay well uh it's funny because i never started out to be a master because when i started out the ratings were much 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 lower than they are now for instance when i was i started playing when i was 16 in tournaments and before I turned 21, I made the top 25 juniors in the United States. And when I made the top 25 juniors, my rating was 2060, which is way below master. That's an expert level. And the top junior in the United States for that rating list was Jim Tarjan, who became a very strong grandmaster. And his rating was 2384. Today, if you had a 2384 rating, you would not make the top 25 juniors in the United States. <laughs> and yeah. Grandmaster Tarjan was 2384. So... It, when I was coming up, I said, boy, if I could just become an expert, that would be great. All the top players in Philadelphia are experts. You know, the only people that are masters are people who, like, quit their jobs and they hang out, you know, in chess clubs in New York. And, and you know, that's never going to happen. But then as time went by, the ratings spread out. And by the late 70s, the, all the people who were experts in the 60s, without really being any better, were all masters then. So I started playing in tournaments when I was 16. When I was 19, I got my expert title. And then I went to college, and then I got a job, and I 
you know, I was an engineer. And then one day Ken Potts came up to me and said, hey, Dan, uh, you, you should start playing again. You'll get your master title without even studying. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, well, the ratings are just much higher now. And, you know, you're, you're easily master now. And I, so I, my rating was about 20, around in the 2060 or so. And I, I hadn't played in a couple of years. I was married and I had a, you know, a house and everything. So I went to a tournament, uh, Hatboro Open, I think, in 1980 when I was about 30. And I played in the tournament and I won my first three games. And in the fourth game, I got paired with National Master Ross Nickel, who always played interesting openings. And we played an interesting game and I won a very nice game and got some bonus points. And then I got invited to the Franklin Mercantile Expert Masters Tournament, where I played against a lot of the people I'd played against growing up and some of the younger experts and masters. And I had a very good tournament. And in the second tournament back, my, my rating became master. So uh, I, I got a master title. And then we had some shenanigans with the rating system that I won't go into because I don't want to take half your podcast. But, <laughs> but eventually my rating settled into master, but I was already in middle age and I wasn't uh, playing in regular tournaments anymore. Um, and it was funny because when I was young, you know, we, we didn't have grandmasters playing. We didn't have the world open. We didn't have all these people you could play against. And of course, as I got older, those things all became possible. You know, the United States, instead of having seven grandmasters like we did in the mid sixties when I was young, you know, now we've got seven grandmasters that I've never heard of plus another 50 more that I have that are all around the United States. So there's a, it's a, it's a whole different ball game now. So that's, oh, yeah. that's how I became a, a master, but, uh, it was, it was rather circuitous because I never started out doing that. But to, to become a master, you have to play in over the board tournaments. The games have to be at least 30 minutes equivalent in length to be a slow rated game. And you have to get your rating up to at least 2200 established to be an NM 2200 to, tw to 2399 is an NM. Wow. Yeah, that's fantastic that you're able to achieve that. And uh, even even though, like you said, the ratings obviously now more people are higher rated, allowing maybe more points to be available out there if you were uh, scoring well against these guys. These are still strong players. I mean, um, those of us that are out, out there doing the over-the-board tournaments, we know, you know, it's it's not just a matter of playing a high-rated player. You still have to make uh, the good moves, the, the critical moves against them. And um, and you've definitely demonstrated a, a prowess and an ability to play really strong, high-level chess. Um, I've, enjoy, I've enjoyed watching several of your games. Like, you're... You're really strong. It's uh, and it shows because there's always those moves where, you know, maybe it's like a, a immediate recapture for myself. I would just immediately take the piece back, but I see you. I see you pause there, and you find a much much deeper move that maybe wins uh, material in a very beautiful way. And that's uh, that's kind of part of the, the becoming a, a master. But obviously, uh, you're going to know even more uh, tips, tricks, etc. For that accomplishing that goal. It's um, it's quite special to see somebody like you do that though. And um, again, we're extremely glad to have you on the show. Um, Additionally, you mentioned um, with openings how people get confused and they try to memorize opening lines versus opening ideas. Is that still something you feel pretty passionately about, that um, we should be looking more at opening ideas and understanding your opening deep that way versus just rote memorization of lines? Or um, All right, well, that's a, that's a deep subject. You, you obviously have to know some lines. You know, anybody who says, Dan Heisman says you shouldn't memorize any opening moves, uh, I've never said that in my whole life. You, you need to know your basic tabiyas. Uh, you know, what are the main lines? The problem is that, you know, you're just using that as a basis. You're, you're not trying to learn every line. For instance, if you think about how many reasonable moves you can get into, if everybody's got two or three reasonable moves on each move and you play 10 moves, that's 20 moves for both players. That's like three to the 20th power. And that's only if there's three reasonable moves. If there's six, then we're talking, you know, even more astronomical. So you're never going to learn every single sideline in the openings that you play, no matter how much you try to memorize things. Uh, there's a thing out there called Chess Opening Wizard, which is a piece of software where you can put your opening repertoire into the software and then train on it. And there's other software that does that, too. And the guy who runs that, Mike, um, he took people of different levels and he asked them to put their entire opening repertoire into his tool and then he counted how many nodes they have for those of you out there it doesn't know what a node is if you play e4 and then you study what happens after c5 or e6 or e5 that's four nodes the first node is e4 and then c5 e5 or e6 are all three different nodes it's as if you're making a graph of what you know and each point on the graph is a node well he he 
had people put their opening repertoire into his tool, and he measured how many nodes they know. And for people rated in the low 1600s, the average number of nodes that they knew were 200. That may sound like a high or low number, but if you if you own modern chess openings, which is used to be everybody used to have that book, now now it's a little <laughs> out of date. But if you have modern chess openings, that's about one page of modern chess openings. So people in the 1600s know one page. Well, I'm a low master, and he did it for low masters, and he said, we know about 2,000 nodes. Wow. Well, that may sound like a lot, but that's only 10 pages of a book. <laughs> instead, of, Or maybe, maybe yeah, about 10 pages of the MCO. Well, compared to a database that's got millions of nodes in it, or even a book which has probably has tens or hundreds of thousands of nodes in it, the number of moves that people at my level know mem memorize is only a couple thousand, which sounds like a lot to the, you know, to the beginner. But compared to all the different possible permutations of what people could do, is actually very, very, very small. So what do we do? Well, it doesn't mean you shouldn't learn anything. But what you're trying to do when you're learning the openings is you're trying to understand the principles of the openings, not just your opening, but every opening, because a lot of principles of openings apply to every position. And then within your position, your opening, there's certain places where your pieces go. There's certain places where you want to put your pawns and where you want to push them in the, op in the middle game. And as you get to be a better player, you start to understand the, the ideas of your opening and what you're trying to do. So, yes, you're trying to memorize some moves. Yes, you're trying to get a feel for things. Yes, you're trying to understand what you're trying to do. But you also have to be flexible. I have a lot of my students make the mistake where they learn the tabia. And then no matter what the opponent plays, they play the tabia moves, even if yeah. they're completely inappropriate. You'll see that in Blitz where people actually drop a piece because they, they just make the next move in the tabia, and the next move in the tabia will lose if someone deviates and has a piece that can capture a piece on that square. It's, uh, it's, it's rather humorous sometimes, the things that people will wrote memor memorize, just kind of like a, I call it a memorized loss. That's what I like to call it that. It's like, um, one other uh, person out there had a question. Um, he asked, if you had one thing to tell your students on how to improve, what would it be? Kind of, kind of a wide open thing right. there. But. So, the, so there's no answer to that question because, you know, if someone comes to me and they're 1,200 and they play way too fast, they're a lot different than a person who's, you know, 1,200 who plays way too slow. Or they might be way different than a 1,500 who also plays too fast as opposed to a 2,000 who, you know, doesn't evaluate positions very well, but he's very, very, very good at analysis. So... You, you you can't just throw a blanket over it. It you know, it's again it's not like school. If you if you took brought me in as a as a substitute teacher to teach a fifth grade class, I would ask, what are we learning in all the subjects? And they'd say, Well in history we're learning about the Civil War and in math we're learning about uh, you know, fractions and in uh, you know, English we're learning about uh, you know, how to read uh, you know, basic uh, bestsellers that are easily read for fourth graders or whatever it is. And you'd find out where they are and you'd say, OK, everybody in the class is kind of up there, at least the average person in the class is. But that's not true in chess. When someone comes to you and they're 1,200, they may be very good at tactics and they're terrible at other things. Uh, uh, Josh Bowman's one of my students. He's a master. And he came to me when he was about 10 or 11. And he loves studying openings. And he, he knew a tremendous amount about openings. He knew probably almost as much as I did. But obviously, the fact that he was only rated like 11 or 1,200 was because he wasn't very good at these other things. And one of the first things I did when I figured that out was I said to Josh, put aside your opening books. <laughs> you, you know enough of that for the next couple of years. I said, let's work on these other things so we can catch up on those. Well, but is everybody like Josh? No, they're not. I mean, everybody's so different. So I tell people, when you're starting out, there's three basic things. I call them the three showstoppers. Number one is not only using basic tactics to win your opponent's material, but even way more important is using basic tactics to not make unsafe moves. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is use all your pieces all the time. In the opening, don't just get out three or four pieces and keep moving them around and around. And no matter what position you're in, even in the end game where your king is safe, make sure your king is, is active as well. So use all your pieces all the time. And the third is learn how to pace yourself with the clock because you know, chess is played with a clock. So don't play way too fast for the time limit or the position. Don't play way too slow. 
learn to read the clock and read the position so that you're taking a reasonable amount of time on each move so that you're using up almost all your time each game. Obviously not all your time and losing on time. But those are the big three. If you can do those three, if you can use safety on your moves as well as your opponents, if you can use all your pieces all the time and not just get seduced by the dark side and want to move your knight six <laughs> times in the opening, and if you can uh, use your time wisely, that'll get you out of that beginning stage and get you up to playing with the intermediates. Oh, yeah, definitely. I like, I like that advice a lot. Um, one other thing I usually tell my students, too, is um, in a position, be careful not to use the word, it's a winning position. I, I feel like I've had students or people that just kind of go to sleep mentally. They get in a position where they're better, and rather than still calculating and thinking about the position because they're better, they have that exchange, they have the pawn, there's like this tendency to like almost go into sleep mode of like trying to trade and not, um, not think as critically. So I do challenge them to, you know, even when you're ahead, and especially when you're ahead, continue to think about the position as, as if you're behind. Because there is that, um, it can be almost like a lackadaisical attitude where you can uh, allow a horrible tactic to hit you. Uh, have you seen that as well? or? Yes, and, and, and that doesn't happen to me because I'm exactly the opposite. So let, let me explain a little bit using an analogy. Let's say I said to you, I'm going to give you $5, and I want you to walk around town with my $5 bill in your pocket. How's that going to affect you? And most people, if they think about it, give me the answer, that shouldn't affect me at all. <laughs> and, and some people, you know, read too much into it and say, oh, I'm, I'm worried about losing your $5 or something. And I'm like, it's $5. It shouldn't really much affect you. But let's say I gave you a, a, a satchel with a million dollars in cash, and now you have to walk around the, 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 street, the streets of you know, your city with that. <laughs> well, everybody's going to be really nervous and really cautious and really worried about having a million dollars. Well, when you start a chess game, you have a draw in hand. A chess game at the start is even. So if you blunder at the start of a game, you're throwing away that half a point that you could have gotten if you, had played, if you and your opponent had both played perfectly. And you threw away the half point, and you, you lost the game. Okay, but suppose you're winning. Suppose you're up a knight, and you, your opponent has no compensation, and you're just killing him, but he's not resigning. Now that's almost as if you have a million dollars on you. Well, you have a lot more to lose now. You don't have a half a point to lose. If you blunder and get back rank mated or lose your queen or something, you're going to throw away a whole point and not a half a point. So you should be way more cautious because you're winning. It's not like you ha don't have anything to lose. It's like you have that million dollars in your pocket now. So you should be more cautious when you do that. So a lot of people don't. They get less cautious because they feel like, oh, well, I'm just winning. I can kind of do almost anything. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. You have a lot more to lose now. This is when you want to be the most careful. If you want to be careless, wait till you're losing. Then you have nothing to lose. If your expected value of the game is now zero, you can try any kind of tricky, crazy thing that may not work and when your opponent sees it and you just lose the answer is well you were losing anyway so you you can throw caution to the wind when you're completely lost so it's exactly the opposite of what some people do they say oh i was winning i started playing fast i got overconfident and i go no when i'm winning it's exactly the opposite then i have a lot to lose then i'm then i'm really uh, cautious because then i really don't want to lose the game then i'm really careful also there's a principle out of this that comes from what you said which is the more you're winning the more you should be concerned about what your opponent is doing. And the more you're losing, the more you want to be concerned about what you're doing. When the game is even at the start of the game, you have to be equally concerned with both players. This is also true in every sport. For instance, suppose your baseball team is up 7-2 to two in the seventh inning. Would you pinch hit for all your best pitchers trying to go up 8-2? to two? And would you take out all your best fielders trying to put in your home run hitters to try to hit a two-run home run? Or would you put in all your best fielders and have your, your best relief pitchers ready to go to try to stop the other team from scoring five runs? I see. Well, the answer is every baseball team understands the idea there. The idea isn't to score more runs. The idea is if you can make the rest of the game very low scoring, your chances of losing are very low. Yeah. If you take out all your best fielders and all your best pitchers and put in all your best hitters who aren't very good fielders and nobody can pitch – and both teams are going to score a million runs in the last three innings, well, then your five-run lead doesn't mean it very much. But if you have all your best defensive players and your best pitchers, and neither team's going to score much in the last few innings, you're going to win. Same thing in football. If you're up 100 to nothing, you're not going to be throwing long bombs on every play trying to get another touchdown. You're going to be trying to run out the clock. In fact, the best thing to do when you're up 100 to nothing is take all your best players out of the game so they don't get hurt. 
because if your star player gets hurt when you're up 100 to nothing, you're, you should be fired as the coach. I had a, so I, all I the sports are the same. In all the sports, you play differently when you're winning, but what you do is you try to stop the other team from scoring when you're winning, or at least you try to fix it so they can't possibly catch up. And in chess, it's no different than football or baseball or, or you know, especially games like football, which are timed. But even baseball, where there's no time and you could still lose the game, even you're up 100 to nothing with two outs in the ninth. If you walk the next 105 people, you lose the game. OK, but chess is like that. You know, you could lose in any you can't lose in every position, but you could draw. You could be up three queens and stalemate him in the, in the at the end. So. You can always throw away a win if you're not careful, and you want to be more careful when you're winning. Nice. Um, one, one quick question from one coach to another is the amount of material that's out there now. Like, I'll have someone tell me, hey, I play on chess.com. Here are my games, and I'll download, like, this massive database of games of this player and start going through a bunch of them. Do you have, like, a way that you're working to, like, filter down the games that people provide you to help kind of see what kind of things they need to work on or – um, how are you working like in this digital age where we could have like 2,000 plus games from one player <laughs> coming uh, at us? Okay, well, obviously I don't want, I don't want all the 2,000 games. So what I tell people is if I'm starting lessons with you and I'm, if you only want one lesson, well, there's no sense in doing that. But let's say we're going to have a few lessons. Then I want to evaluate where you are. So there's two ways to do that. The first way is to ask the – I ask my student to provide me with recent indicative games – Games that are indicative of how they think they play. They could be wins. They could be draws. They could be losses. But I want, I want like a couple indicative, two or three indicative games, which give me some idea of what kind of mistakes they're making, what they do, what they don't know, that kind of thing. Then I have on my chess.com, my, sorry, not chess.com, my ICC library, I have 1,200 different things in my library and about – Maybe a hundred of those are what I call indicative puzzles. Mm -hmm. These are puzzles that are not just any old puzzle where you say, you know, white to play and win. Let's see if he can find the win. These are puzzles which I'm trying to measure very specific ideas to see if they understand them. For instance, I have a very basic counting puzzle that I show people. Um, I'm not sure if I can share the screen with you to show things like that. Um, um, go for probably it. Probably not. No, it's up to you, I guess. But um... uh, Yeah, but anyway, I have puzzles. And... Each puzzle has maybe one or two or three or four specific things that I want to test them on. So I'm, I'm, look, I'm hitting the problem from two different sides. The one side is the time management side and the actual execution side comes from their games. What are they actually doing? While on the, um, while on the other side, um, I've got these very specific puzzles that I like to give everybody. I think in my book, uh, Is Your Move Safe, I show some of those puzzles in the introduction to the book or in chapter one. I forget, if, I forget what I call it. I think I called it chapter one uh, where we did these, these puzzles. Cool. That's really helpful to know about. Thank you for that idea. And that's kind of neat too, like, almost like a pretest with the puzzles to get an idea of like what are they seeing well, what are they not seeing, and then maybe you can kind of focus on where you're seeing those deficiencies um, in, in, in the training with them. That's a, good, that's a good idea. Thank you very much for that point. Um, it looks like one of our guys out there far away had a question. He sure. wrote, he wrote in, um, as a grumpy adult with bad habits and misconceptions, how can I identify and work on weaknesses in my games? So he's, um, I don't know if he heard the earlier part of the podcast where I talked about the feedback part, you know, one of your skills, you know, chess is about one third knowledge and about two thirds skills. One of your skills is your ability to deal, deal with feedback and to, be able to, to learn from it and not get, you know, not, not take it the wrong way. Uh, so when you get feedback on what you're doing wrong, whether it's from an engine, from an instructor, from a database, uh, wherever you're getting the feedback from, you want to be able to, to process the feedback in such a way that you're asking yourself the question, if this kind of thing came up again, not necessarily the identical position, although in the opening it might be the identical position, if this kind of thing came up again, how would I decrease my chances of making the same kind of mistake? Like, for instance, one of the most common mistakes that intermediate players make is quiescence errors. And I, I've written many articles on why people make quiescence errors. And, you know, if you make a quiescence error, and almost every intermediate player makes a lot of quiescence errors, if you make quiescence errors, then once people point them out to you, 
you have to be able to say, how, how do I do this better? Now, I have things that I can tell people to ask themselves, but if you don't ask those questions consistently, then you're probably going to end up making the same quiescence errors again. But it, it's those kind of things that, that are important. And, and that ra raises that issue also of asking questions. I'm all, when I'm thinking, I'm always asking questions to myself. And if you watch my YouTube videos where yep. I play against the computer, you can kind of hear me questioning myself as I'm doing my analysis. When you said quiescent there, what did you mean by that in terms of that type of error? Like what do those errors look like on the chessboard, the quiescent errors? Okay, a quiescent error is where you stop too soon and you don't continue your analysis to the point where the position is quiescent, meaning no more checks, captures, and threats of, of any consequence. So let's give a really easy example. Let's say you have a queen and a rook lined up on a file and your opponent has a rook on the back rank and you could play queen check and then he takes your queen and then you take back with the rook and you checkmate him. Okay. Well, everybody above level 1100 or so is going to sacrifice their queen and back rank mate them. But suppose you're below 1100 and you just look at the board and you say, oh, I can't play queen to the back rank. He'll take my queen with, my, with his rook and I'll lose my queen. That would be a quiescence error. Okay. Yeah, that makes but, a lot of but, sense. Thank but you. what intermediate players do is they do that in, in uh, lots of positions. And what's interesting is people come to me and they say, why do I get these puzzles right in the book and I get them wrong in a game? They're the exact same idea. And I say, that's easy. In the, in the book, they tell you, don't make a quiescence error. There's a win here. So if you're sacrificing the exchange, you're going to look further to see whether you can win a rook or checkmate or win another piece and end up ahead in material. <laughs> But when the same 1500 player plays in a game, he gets that position. He says, oh, I can't take that rook with a knight. The knight's guarded. I'll lose, I'll lose a rook for a knight. That's losing the exchange. I can't do that. And then he won't look to the next move. But if it was a puzzle, he would have said, well, there's got to be something here. Maybe after rook takes pawn takes, there's something here. And he would have seen it. Well, good players just don't do that. Good players look at a position like that. And they don't, they don't care whether it's a puzzle or the game. They're going to say, if I play rook takes knight and he just takes my rook, is there any further checks, captures, or threats that make it worth my while to, to continue to investigate? If the answer is no, then they're not going to play Rook Takes Knight. They're not going to look at it further. If the answer is yes, they're going to look at it further. If they discover that indeed it does work, like it does in the puzzle, then they're going to play it. And if they discover it doesn't work, they didn't risk anything except a, another 30 seconds on their clock to see that Rook Takes Knight didn't work. They're not risking the exchange. They're only risking losing the ex looking at losing the exchange. And, of course, that's just risking time on your clock. That's not risking the exchange. You simply won't play it if, it, if it's no good. Yeah, I think Maurice actually, Ashley actually um, expands on that more, and he says, what grandmasters don't see, and the idea of playing pieces to protected squares, like the idea of putting a knight on a square where a pawn could capture it. Um, but like you're saying, they're looking more deeply, and they're considering those moves partly because of those puzzles and such, and they're just looking for that same pattern, that same uh, you know, uh, thing that's going to lead to the outcome that they want. And they aren't necessarily restricted by those thoughts of the begin beginner player of, I can't put a piece on that square. So I thought that was a, a neat thing that I saw Maurice actually talking about uh, a while back. And uh, uh, another one of his was, um, like, Kai, uh, it was one of the martial art ideas of, like, taking your opponent's action and saying, not where did that piece go, but, like, the square is left behind. Do you have... Do you have something similar like that where you're, as your opponent's moving, you're looking for like what uh, change in the position or helping your students see what change in the position to help them? Yes, so I tell them when your opponent moves, you want to ask two questions. See, a lot of people lose games because when the opponent moves, they ask the wrong question. They say, why did he do that? Well, why did he do that is the wrong question because if the move has six things that it does and you're satisfied with one of the six, then the other five can kill you. For instance, suppose you attack his queen with a bishop and he moves the queen. Well, if you ask yourself, why did he do that? The answer is he did that because if he didn't move the queen, I'd take it with a bishop. But suppose the queen moved to threaten mate and you don't notice that because you figured, well, I know why he moved the queen. He moved it because I'm threatening with a the bishop. Then they, on the next move, you get checkmated because you figured, oh, I knew why he moved the queen. So I tell people, don't ask why did he make the move. Ask the two questions. One, what are all the things that move does, which includes the things that that, that, that piece is no longer guarding, for instance. W what you just said, the things that, that are it's no longer doing as well as the things it's now doing. And, and, of course, it involves all the other things like the discovered attacks and so on. And the second question is, is that move safe? You know, unless you're playing people who are really, 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 really good, 
there's a good chance that the, that a couple of times in the game they're going to make moves that are not safe. And if you don't ask yourself if the opponent's moves are safe, you might miss the fact that your opponent, who might be better than you, is making a very unsafe move. So, so you want to ask both of those things. By the way, I have a chess.com article, which people can access through my website, uh, which is called, what, what, are all the things, um, what are all the things on a board that a move can affect? And I started listing things. So I said, all right, so the first thing people look at is, on the square the pieces move to, are there s captures on that square where somebody can win your piece? Okay, but then there's all the squares that where your piece moves to where it can go on the next move where it's threatening things. And then there's all the things that that piece used to guard. And then there's all the discoveries it allows and so on. And I listed 16 different types of things that a move could do. And when people read the article, some people were very clever and they came up with three or four more <laughs> of different generic type of things that can happen when you make a move, which involve, could involve almost every square on the board. So a lot of beginners make the mistake that they just look at the piece that moved and of course, you see this a lot with beginners. They miss discoveries, for instance, because they're only looking at the piece that moved. And after you get up to, to 11, 1200, you start seeing the discoveries too. But, but all the side effects of, of the things a piece can move could be a rather large side effect, in which case, you know, if that side effect happens to be the key thing in the position, you better find that out because that could cost you the game if you don't realize what's happening. Nice. We'll have to get a link to that article later. Maybe I can post that beneath the YouTube video so people can have access to that uh, chess.com article. Additionally, like with your students, um, there's always that potential that you go into a tournament as a student and uh, you lose your first round. Do you have things that you do with your students to help them get mentally um, prepared or help overcome those uh, the challenges of like maybe a loss that maybe was devastating to them to help them in that next round or um, those types of coaching things going on? or Yes. Well, first of all, I tell everybody, you know, you're, you're going to lose a lot of games. If you're, if you're going to be a good player, you're going if, to, if you're one of those people that losses upset you tremendously, you're probably never going to get to be a good player because good players hate to lose, but not to the point where they don't want to play. They want to get back on the horse and ride it again. So, Everybody's going to lose. You have to get used to losing. You, have to, you want to learn from your losses. And one of my quotes that I tell people is, I say, don't worry about losing a game. Worry about playing a game and not learning anything. If you play a game like, let's say you scholar mate someone in four moves, that should be one of the worst games you ever play in terms of learning something. Because if you know what a scholar mate was to begin with, and your opponent let you do it and you tried it, then you probably didn't learn anything in that game. You're much better off in games where you lose excruciating games and it hurts for the next, you know, 20 minutes, but you learned a lot and you say, I'm never going to do that again than you would if you scholar made someone. So you're just going to, you're going to lose a lot of games. And I tell, also tell people, sometimes I have a piece of wood, like my, my uh, book shelf that you see behind me. And I tell people, knock on that piece of wood. And they knock on the piece of wood. And I say, now unknock on the piece of wood. And they go, what do you mean? I say, I want you to fix it so you never knocked on the piece of wood. And they say, well, I can't do that. I can't affect the past. And I say, all right, well, isn't that the same thing when you lose a chess game? Once you lose a chess game, it's over. It may hurt, just like your knuckles may hurt if you knock on the wood, but it's over. The best thing you could do when you lose a chess game is find out what are all the reasons why I lost and how can I minimize the chances of losing the same way again in the future? In that sense, it's a great learning opportunity yeah, that's if really you don't advice. look at it that way, you just look at it as, I want to win, I hate to lose. If I lose, then I'm mad and I'm upset and I can't play. Then you're really looking at it wrong and you have to, yeah. you have to really get over it. I, I try to look at it with the learning thing, but we've definitely seen Tilted Tuna on stream before. I get a little <laughs> get a little upset over some loss. Like, oh, come on, this is ridiculous. Um, I have a little story on that. Uh, I assume you know who Jennifer Shahadi and Greg Shahadi are? <laughs> Recently, yes. We had Greg Shahadi on my show, and I didn't know who he was, and I was terribly embarrassed when Greg. I learned who he was because he'd come on, and people... Anyway, yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. I just All thought... right, right. So, so Greg's father was Mike Shahadi, and Mike and I are contemporaries. Mike's a couple years older than I am. And so I played my, Mike many times. And remember I was telling you I had a job and a house, and I was rusty. So in 1977, I hate to say it, I won the Philadelphia Open, and I got invited to the Philadelphia Championship. And by then, all the local players had become masters, but I hadn't because I was, you know, I had a job as an engineer, and I was had a house and everything. 
but I won, and I won the right to play all the other Masters in, in, a, in the Invitational. And I had I had won that same tournament four years before when I was 23. I was I was the Philadelphia Invitational champ. But the second time I played four years later, I was very rusty, and I was by far the lowest rated player. Everybody else was over 2,200, and I was like 2060 or something. And uh, and I played Mike Shahadi in the first round. And we played a gambit line where I got a really good play, but I hadn't played in a long time and I was rusty and I was playing too slow because, you know, when you haven't played in a long time, you have to shake off the rust. And I got into time trouble and we played a whole bunch of blitz moves in time trouble. When the smoke cleared, I was lost on move 50 or whatever it was, 48. And I resigned the game and, and tournament director uh, Jim uh, Politowski came over to me and he said, did you look at night E1? And I said, yes, but what move are you talking about? I said, I think I looked at it on move 40. And he says, look at it on move 42. And I said, okay. So we went back and we set up the board and we went to it on move 42. And we looked at knight e1 and it turns out that that would have probably won me the game. Ugh. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, I didn't have time. I was down to a couple minutes on my clock to make six moves. And I looked at that idea on move 40 and when it didn't work, I didn't go back to it on move 42. But yeah, you're right, it would have worked. I said, oh, well, and Mike Shahadi looked at me, and Mike said, said, Dan, you don't look very upset for someone who just lost a really important game that you could have won. And I turned to Mike, and I said, Mike, I can't cry over spilt milk. I said, I much, much would rather have won that game, but it's in the past. I got another game to play in half an hour after I ate lunch, and I can't sit here and worry about it now. Nice. <laughs> but he was just amazed that I, would, I, I, could just shook, I just shook it off and said, oh, well, bad loss. <laughs> Who's next? Yeah, it definitely is hard sometimes to hear those movies, especially following the game, to know what might have been there. Um, we had one other question coming from Chess with Ovi. Um, his question was, how do you learn to defend better in chess? He said he played a 25-50 player yesterday, and he played moves that um, he would sacrifice pawns and his pe um, and pieces would take... Hold on, what is all this? I played moves that would sacrifice pawns, and when his pieces take a pawn, I get my own pieces out with tempo. I was crushing him after about four to five moves like that. Because I had all oh, the second, activity. Make sure this sound yeah, this is, is not coming from me here. Oh, sorry. There you go. Sorry. He said, all go the ahead. activity, he's done some sacrifices, lots of activity in the position. That sort of play is done to me all the time, and I don't know how to defend. So how do you defend uh, chess in unknown positions? So he's basically saying, like, when he, um, he gets into positions where maybe he's taking the pawns on. I played that would sack pawns. Hmm. I don't know. I'm not really. Maybe I can post it. I'll, I'll, well, I'll share this back with you as well. Well, again, you know, with... <laughs> If, if someone says to you, how do you defend against active pieces? <laughs> we, we could come up with a million different positions where people have active pieces and the defenses would be various. And in some of the cases, you would have no defense. The computer's going to say, no matter what you do, you're losing. But the problem with open-ended questions like that is a lot of times either the answer is position dependent or there's so many different answers to the question that answering it in one paragraph doesn't do it any justice. Yeah. You know, I, I got this on my T. I had a TV show on chess.com for a year called uh, Q&A with Coach Heisman. And people would say to me, like, I'm 1600. What do I need to do to become 1800? <laughs> and I'm like, how would I know from that question? <laughs> what makes you 1600 and what you would need to do to get to be 1800? I mean, it's not yeah. like all 1600s I, are I exactly think he's, the same. He's actually trying to clarify now. He's saying, OK, how, good. How do I defend an unknown positions when players take you so far out of the book? Is there a system you can employ to make sure you don't blunder? Maybe, the, um, and maybe that clarifies his question. He's trying to say, like, you know, what what can you do to help just keep a sound peace of mind um, as you're playing new new positions? I guess. All right. Well, uh, first of all, you know, of all the games I ever played, what percentage did I eventually get out of the book? Hundred. And the answer is ninety nine point some, except for the ones that were book book games the whole way. <laughs> right. You know, maybe. Maybe my opponent fell into a trap and resigned. That was a book trap. But other than that, not, so you're going to get out of the book every game. So I have some people who say to me, I panic when somebody takes me out of the book. And I go, but that happens every game. If you panic, you're going to panic every single game because someone's always going to. I mean, you could get to the end of your book and there could be even more book that you don't know about that. You know, I'm a master. I know 15 moves. But if I look it up in a database, there's 20 moves. And I didn't know the last five. Well, OK, they took me out of my book when they got the move 16. So, you know. You're always going to deal with that. That that's not answering his question. That's just an aside that says yes, you're going to get into these positions. Then you want to make sure that you're at, you have to treat every game, whether it's in the opening or whether middle game or end game. Once you're out of your book, you have to analyze carefully. You have to avoid 
playing what I call hope chess. Hope chess is where you, you look at a move that you could play and you, you don't ask yourself, what are all my opponent's checks, captures, and threats that he could play after this move? And do I have a safe way of meeting every single one of them? Because suppose you don't do that. Suppose you just make a move and then your opponent makes a threat or a capture and you say, uh-oh, what do I do now? Is it possible that there's no answer? And the answer to that is, of course. <laughs> there's lots of checks, captures, and threats in chess where if you're not careful and they make them, there's no defense. So the number one thing people need to do is when you're playing slow games, long time control games, and you're making a move, before you make that move, you have to visualize the move, ask yourself, what are all my opponent's dangerous checks, captures, and threats? He may have some that are completely innocuous that you don't have to worry about. But make sure that on the next move, you have a safe way of meeting them. Because once you make a move and your opponent does a check, capture, or threat that you have not anticipated, it's entirely possible that you're just lost. There, there's no way to defend what he's doing. Yeah. So I, I tell people that in all positions, and pretty much when I've tested people over the years, almost everybody rated under 1,700 USCF or 1,700 FIDE plays a form of hope chess. Now, when people have other ratings, a lot of people out there think their ratings are absolute. They think a 1,700 rating in Blitz Chess is the same as a 1,700 rating on Chess.com, which is the same as a 1,700 FIDE rating. That's not true. The, the, our Pat Elo, when he made the rating system, it's, it's relative to the, pe to the population of the people in the rating system. It's not absolute. If you have a, a room full of grandmasters and a room full of first graders and nobody has a rating in either room and you have them all play each other, they're all going to come out with the same ratings. The kid in the first grade room who won all five of his games is going to have a 2,000 rating. And of all the grandmasters, the one who won all his games in the other room when they all, they're all unrated is going to have a 2,000 rating too. And everybody who lost the five games is going to be rated 1,000, even though we know the grandmaster who lost all his games in the grandmaster room could beat everybody in the other room blindfolded. It, it doesn't matter. The rating system doesn't know that. So you have to be careful because I get students sometimes that say, oh, I'm 1,700. And then I start looking at their games and they're like 1,200. And because I'm measuring in terms of FIDE or USCF, and they're measuring in terms of some server that they're playing on, which gave them a 1700 rating or some computer they played against that said they were 1700. And when I say to them, uh, I, hate to, I hate to tell you, but on USCF scale, you're really only about 1200. They, get, they think I'm insulting them because they think the ratings are like absolute and that I'm telling them they're really 500 points weaker than what the computer's telling them. And I'm not. I'm just saying on a different rating system, the one that I normally use, you're not 1700, even though you are 1700 on your computer or your server. Yeah. So you've been playing chess for many, many decades, a long time, right? Yeah. Coaching and organizing, publishing. What, yep. have you, what have you loved the most about your experience with chess? And uh, what do you think the future of U.S. chess looks like? Oh, my. Um, let's take the first question first. Uh, say, that, say, say that one short again. Uh, the beginning there being, what have you loved the most about chess uh, during your time with, with chess now? Um, what's your favorite memory or experience with it? Well, I guess... Uh, I would split that into two things. One would be the things that I've discovered that I don't think anyone else has seen before me. Um, I get a lot of credit for, for hope chess, even though people use it to mean anything you hope for in chess, and that's not what my original intention was, but I guess I have to take the good with the bad. So I've done a lot of things like that. I came up with the two move triggers. I came up with the idea of calling the things counting in the tactics. I've done a whole bunch of things where I've created names for things, just like Charles Hurtan created the name Sneaky Pin, which I thought was wonderful, where he's describing what happens when you take advantage of squares that pin pieces are not really guarding. He called that a Sneaky Pin, and I thought that was a great idea. And I think giving things names that don't have names helps people understand them and remember them. So I'm very proud of that kind of stuff. When it comes to what I loved in chess myself, in terms of not necessarily my accomplishments, but what I enjoy doing, I, I certainly enjoy helping people. You know, some of my students might say, oh, well, <laughs> you know, Dan's, Dan, Dan criticized my move and he, he must like criticizing my moves. It's like, no, 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 I don't. I, that's probably the worst part of my job is when people take things defensively. But I, I enjoy when they help and people come back and say, oh, man, you, you told me to study those easy tactics over and over again. And, and now when I'm playing games, I'm starting to see them faster and more accurately. Or, or people say to me, um, you know, I always thought that learning chess was just about acquiring knowledge, and now I realize that a lot of it is developing my skills instead. Or I read your book, and 
you know, I learned a lot about X or Y or something like that. Um, you know, that's very gratifying to, to, to knowing that you're helping people. Just like now, if, if people, I'm, I'm not quite 70 yet. <laughs> Give me a couple of weeks. But, uh, you know, if people see this interview in 30 years and, and they learn something, that, that would make me very happy. Oh, yeah, and they definitely will. You have a lot of uh, insight into chess that, you know, it takes a long time to acquire. And um, it's really nice that you're here sharing some of these insights and, and ideas for our improvement. And um, another question that came in was about uh, books on psychology of chess. And this is, mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll go back to his next question there. But um, do you have any books you'd recommend for, like, helping us uh, mentally with the game, like to, to be stronger, I guess, mentally while we're playing? Or, or do you more so see it as if we improve you as a chess player through these other methods that you have, that'll kind of take care of itself? You know, because that's, that's another possibility. Okay, so there's, chess is a mental sport. So obviously your mental approach to your game is very important. If you, for instance, if you think you're going to lose, that almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I tell people, you should play as if they never invented the rating system. If, if you play chess as if they never invented the rating system. I've seen people offer draws against higher rated players when they're up a rook. And they're winning easily, and they would never, ever, 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 ever do that if they hadn't invented the rating system. But they're so afraid of the fact that their opponent's 200 points higher rated that they're like, okay, I can get my three rating points by getting a draw, and if I keep playing on, I might lose because this guy's 200 points higher rated than me, so I'm going to give him a draw. So, you know, play as if they haven't invented the rating system. But in terms of books for psychology, we have to separate them into two different types of books. There's the psychology that involves your actual and analytical and evaluation capabilities. For instance, you mentioned that book, Calculation, at the start. I wrote a book called The Improving Chess Thinker, which is a completely unique book that shows how people think from 800 up to Greg Shahadi at 2,500. And I give protocols with, with six different positions for each class. There you go. He's holding it up. Thank you very much, Jacob. Um, yeah, so this is a this is a unique book. I think that's is that the first edition? That might be the first edition. Um, um, for, forward by Lev Albert, and I'm not sure on the. I guess I can open up to see the edition, right? Uh, let, let me take a look here. I can tell you if that's the first edition. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, the second edition is purple. Yours is blue. Yeah, I got the first edition. I guess. Origi yeah, the second original. edition, which is a great. By the way, whenever I come out with new editions, I try to greatly expand the book so it's not just a couple of things here or there. I don't, I don't want people picking up the new edition and saying this is really just a cleaned up printing. Uh, yeah, the second edition is, let's see, 2014. The first edition is 2009. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so that's one type of chess psychology. But let's talk about the psychology psychology and not the, the mental part of chess, but the the the, the the way you, the aspect of how you want to look at, you know, being optimistic or playing like a tiger, or whatever. There's a whole bunch of books like that. Uh, the one is, I think it's called Play Like a Tiger, uh, by the gentleman from England who uh, passed away a couple years ago, uh, Simon Webb, I think. Uh, Play Like a Tiger. Uh, I have a book that I bought from Krogius, which is not a very easy book to read. Grandmaster Krogius wrote it. It was translated into English. It's called Chess Psychology, and that's where I learned about type, different types of visualization errors like uh, retained image errors and things like that. I also thought I learned about quiescence errors from that book, but I just reread the book a couple weeks ago, and quiescence errors weren't in there, so I must have oh, learned it somewhere else. But it's called Chess Psychology. Uh, there's a few more of them. Um, Chess for Tigers. Um, gee, I have a whole bunch of them here, but uh, it would take me a while to go find them. But yeah. there are there are at least four or five books that are more written uh, that where the emphasis is more on your psychological makeup during the game, and they give examples with positions, of course, because the book's too dry if they don't do that. But it's more about how you're thinking and things like that, nice. um, and that they range in from fairly advanced to, to fairly basic. Cool. Well, I really appreciate your <clears throat> thorough answer on that. And of course, if there are more books we want to add later, I can give you the YouTube link, and we can always put them in the description below. Um, additional links to books if, um, if, you, if some hit your mind. Right, and there's an awful lot of books where it talks about that stuff. For instance, Andy Soldis has a bunch of books, <clears throat> excuse me, like Grandmaster Secrets of the Opening or uh, Studying Chess Made Easy, and he talks about psychological things in those books. It's just not, they're not the entire subject of the entire book, but you get that kind of stuff in the books. Uh, how about uh, Grandmaster Rousen's two books, uh, the uh, Seven Deadly Chess Sins and Chess for Zebras. Again, they're not 100% on psychology, 
but they're a lot about your mental makeup. Yeah. So yes, those are definitely books that would fall in that category. Um, okay, another question coming in is um, about your website. It says, teaching anyone from kids to seniors, I'm in my 30s and worried about how much I'll be able to improve. How much improvement do you find is practical and typical for adults who may have recently discovered chess? Okay, so <laughs> I get this question a lot. Uh, let, let's, let's take a couple of examples. Let's say Magnus Carlsen comes to me at age 33 and says, Dan, I need a new coach. I need some new ideas. I see you've written some neat books and stuff. I really want to be a lot better at 40 than I was at 33. <laughs> I'm going to say, Magnus, you're already one of the greatest players who ever lived. As your brain deteriorates, you're going to be like every other great player who was great world champion in his 20s. <laughs> By the time you're 40, you're going to find those 20-year-old top grandmasters are going to start taking away your world title. And Dan Heisen's probably not going to help you that much. On the other hand, suppose someone comes to me who's the exact same age as my Magnus, and they don't even know how to move the pieces. And they say to me, Dan, I've never learned how to play chess. Can you teach me how to play and, and teach me some basic strategies? And, and I want to be a lot better by the time I'm 40 than I am now. And I go, oh, wow, of course. I can, Man, if, you, if I can get you to learn chess and go to a chess club and start playing people and stuff, we can make you a pretty good player by the time you're 40. You know? <clears throat> so we're taking him from basically a zero level way up into the you know, mid-thousands or higher, depending on you know, how much time he has and how talented he is. But poor Magnus is going to lose 50 rating points from the time he's 33 to the time he's 40, pretty much no matter what he does. There was a guy who was 90 years old, and he was reading about brain activity. And I guess you've heard this thing about as you get older, you want to have not just do physical activities. You want to do proactive brain activities like crossword puzzles or play chess or whatever. And this guy read that, and he said, gee, I want to keep my brain active. I'm 90 years old, but I never learned how to play chess. Or, or I just learned when I was a kid and I haven't played at all. And I, maybe I should start playing now that I'm 90. And he started playing in USCF tournaments when he was 90 and his rating was 900. And by the time he was 93, he was up to 12 or 1300. Wow. Well, that makes sense because he didn't know anything at 90. So even though his brain was deteriorating at 93, he didn't know anything at 90. By the time he was 93, he knew a fair amount about chess and he got a lot better. So now we could go back to the person who asked that question. He's in his 30s. If he's already a USCF master in his 30s like I was, then he's probably not going to get a lot better if he's in his 30s already. But if he's like never took up chess seriously and he's more like the 90-year-old that learned how to play when he was a kid and then maybe he played a little in high school with his friends and now his, his kids are now 12 years old and they're playing with their friends and he wants, <laughs> he wants a chance to, to play, he can learn a tremendous amount. He could be way better by the time he's 40 than he is when he's 33 because he's starting from such a low level that you can learn a tremendous amount even though if he was a grandmaster he would have hit his peak you know five years earlier great answer. so everybody gets confused about that i have people yeah. tell me you know gee i read that you hit your peak when you're 27 and i'm 33 i guess i shouldn't take any lessons because i can't get better the answer is no 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 the top players in the world hit their peak when they're you know in their late 20s <laughs> That, does, that doesn't mean if you know nothing when you're 33, you can't be a lot better when you're 40. Well, I know you have to get going soon for a student that's coming, but um, before you do, I wanted to ask uh, one or two more questions here. Um, sure. One of them is about chess at the high levels is becoming very like saturated with theoretical lines, um, memorized play kind of things happening, and many of the top players believe that maybe chess 960 might be the future of competitive chess due to that uh, amount of saturation of theory and such. Do you... Do you see it going that way, that maybe 960 would somehow dominate the chess world in the future? Well, anything is possible. I think, I think what's more like going to happen is if the computers get so good that they kind of ruin chess, and at th this point they haven't done that. They, they certainly made it, you know, like you see grandmasters avoiding a lot of sharp lines now in the openings because it's too easy for the computers to find theoretical things in sharp lines that kind of ruin the, uh, ruin, ruin the opening. So they, now all of a sudden you see all these Joko pianos where you used to never see Joko pianos, you know, 10 years ago. So you see that being affecting the game. But um, I think if the computers get that good, then a lot of people who are young are going to say, you know, I... Uh, being a professional chess player probably isn't the most interesting game because the computers are so good and it's so easy to learn from them. We haven't nearly reached that point yet, thank goodness. And chess is always going to be a great game for people on the Internet and people that aren't that good because we're not affected by that. Even me at the master level, if you said to me, computers have pretty much solved chess, the answer is 
which they haven't, of course. I'm just saying even if they had, it wouldn't affect me hardly at all. Okay, it's only the people who make their living playing chess, as you say, that would be affected. I think if they got desperate and they started saying, oh, yeah, we really need to snazz it up and we're going to do that. But actually, they're doing that in a different way right now. What we're seeing online is they're playing a lot of tournaments with very faster time controls to make it easier to, for people to watch online. And the, the interest is just as big, but also the games are, there's more decisive games because, you know, obviously that people make more mistakes when they have to play faster. And the trend has been that way for years. So the trend is rather going toward faster time limits, shorter time limits, than it is toward going toward Chess 960. But it's not to say that Chess 960 will disappear. It looks like it's pretty much established a, 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 a small grip. I saw we had a like the first Chess 960 World Championship that one of the top players in the world, I forget which one of the top grandmasters won it. So it's, it's going to be around. But as a panacea to replace chess, um, my bet would be against it, but I, I would never bet anything 100%. Uh, it's possible. Okay, and then I guess we have one more here. What did you think of the recent uh, Twitch Pog Championships, if you saw that? The, they have a new Pog... I'm not aware of this actually. I've seen, I saw like one clip of it with Nakamura doing something, but I wasn't really sure. wasn't really sure what was going on to be honest when I saw it. Um, have you watched that stuff at all or? No, I haven't. In fact, uh, I know what a podcast is, but a POG. Yeah, I was a little point, lost. Uh, a point. Are they showing you his, from his point where, where Nakamura is playing and he's and and only you can hear him and his opponent can't, and therefore he's talking all the time. Is that what they're talking about? It looks like it was uh, chess for newbies versus chess newbies, like a bunch of new people playing is what Faraway's saying, just uh, just famous newbies maybe. Like, I don't know. I'm not, I, it's not a good question for either of us, I guess, because we're both a little bit out on that one. I'm, um, I've definitely heard a lot about it, but I haven't done anything with it yet. So um, anyway, um, it's been a real pleasure to have you here today. It's been really neat to see you know, and, and hear about all these things with chess. Um, I'm always trying to grow my way, way of working with my students and, um, and and get better at teaching chess as well. So I'm really happy with um, you coming here today and, and the insights you gave. And also, I'm excited to check out your book and maybe get that second edition as well with, yeah. the, with the improvements. I mean, that's that's five years later, so that would give you a lot of time to go back and maybe add some material, like you said. And uh, and you are a very right, thoughtful I, I would, author. So By the way, people ask me, you know, what's your best book? And all my books are so different that that's such a hard question to answer. But I would think if you're not you know, rated over, you know, 1800, my book, The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book, I think is a really, really good book. I think they're all good books. I, as I said, I like to write unique books where you can't find them in other places. But uh, th I put a lot of heart into giving people a lot of tips through that book. There's really three books I have that are tip kind of books. That one includes it in game kind of mode. Uh, if you want the light and easy version, then you could pick up everyone's second chess book but make sure to buy the second edition the second edition yeah. is greatly expanded from the first edition and the third would be the book uh, guide to chess improvement which is published by every man and we're hearing a lot of feedback too from people in the chat saying how much they love the videos you did on icc uh, what a difference you made for them in terms of their chess learning outside of this uh, interview today and they just wanted to say thanks you know um for, for that experience uh, so hey uh, if it wasn't for you guys <laughs> i'd be making that in a vacuum I, I love to teach and i love to make the videos and everybody who watched my icc videos i have 400 of them and if you're an icc member you have access to all of them through my website or almost all of them but now of course i i uh, my youtube channel is available to everybody it's free i there's no monetization of the channel uh, you just go, I have, a, I think I have 117 right now. I'm going to have a contest for my one year anniversary, which is coming up in about a month. And I'll probably be giving away a free lesson or two to subscribers on my uh, YouTube channel. Wow. Cool. That's fantastic. Well, thank you again, Dan. I know, like you mentioned, you've got to get to that student, but, um, really appreciate the time that you gave today and the answers you gave and the thoroughness of those answers. And, um, look forward to seeing you again sometime, you know, and, and maybe communicating outside of this as well about chess. Um, you're a great guy, and I really appreciate all that you've done for, for this wonderful game. And I'm um, extremely thankful for your ICC videos as well. Those are very instructive. And uh, like I said, your cadence during the lectures is fantastic. I can, I can stay right with you. I'm able to think critically as you're going through the positions, as you pause. And um, really nice job with uh, what you've done in your career. And um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see that you're still out there coaching. And uh, maybe I'll reach out to you sometime for some help as well. So thank you. Jacob, thanks for having me on, and uh, if you'd like to do this again in six months or a year or something, uh, get me while I'm still young, and let's do, let's do it again, and we'll, we'll talk about a whole bunch of new subjects. That sounds fantastic. You take care, Dan. Have a wonderful day, and thanks again for coming by the channel.
Uh, take Thank care. Thank you, Jacob, and thanks for all the watchers. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. You take care. See you soon, Dan. Bye. Bye.